Um, the exam is Tuesday. Wait, is that right? Yeah. Or Thursday? Yeah. Tuesday, yeah. It could be better for Whatever it's in the syllabus. It could be better for the teachers. OK. Well, I'll think about that next semester when I write the syllabus. <laughs> um, OK, so exam one is going to cover particle statics. Rigid body statics. And centroids. And what that means is one of the practice problems that's sets of practice problems that up that is up on D2L won't be on the exam. The the one on uh, structures. Okay. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but the centroid stuff, um, there's something I want to say about that. Uh, so I talked about the integral definition, and I did one calculation involving integrals. Um, but if you work through the practice problems, um, and I'll get this, sorry, I don't have the solutions up. I'll get those up today, um, you know, by the end of the night. Um, none of those require integrals. Okay, those just require uh, breaking the object up into individual pieces and using that sum formula. Okay, and so that's all you have to be, that's all you're going to be accountable for on the exam. Um, you don't have to do any integrals. Um, you will get at least once during the semester, you'll get a problem set where you have to do an integral, but. Um, for the exam, you just need to know how to break it up into individual pieces where you have a formula for the centroid and then um, and then use that formula. Um, and I will give you all the like all the equations that you have in class and any formulas. So like if there's if there's a centroid problem, where you have to break something up into two rectangles and a triangle, say, or yeah, let's say two rectangles and a triangle. Um, I'll give you the formulas for the centroid of the triangle and the rectangle, but you still need to know how to how to use that formula. And it's not always. Uh, it would be a very bad idea to say that sounds that sounds easy. I think I can just figure it out when when I get the test. You know, uh, you need to do a couple of those problems because there are some things that are confusing at first. You have to do some sort of mental gymnastics to turn bodies around and whatever. But but anyways, yeah, don't worry about trying to trying to calculate integrals. Um, that's something you'll get plenty of time to work through, uh, like just on problem sets. Okay. Any other questions about the exam? All right. Uh, you'll have the whole period to work on it, but it won't it won't be written to take quite the whole period. Um, so I'd like you to just feel relaxed, feel like you can go at whatever pace. I don't, you know, I don't want to be testing like how fast you can hammer through this stuff. So you can. Um, you know, that means really whatever method you want to use. I mean, if, like, if you have a problem, for example, where you have a rigid body like this, and you have loads acting here, here, let's see. So, what would we do? Say you had something like this, okay? Well, to calculate the moments of this, it it's way, way faster to, just think of the perpendicular distance, right? Think of the moments the way you did it in physics. Um, but you'll have plenty of time to write out that table if you prefer to do it that way. Like that kind of thing. You don't have to worry about shortcuts. Just worry about making sure that you show me that you understand the how to do it right, you know? Yeah. How do you how do you want us to show in terms of loads? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
And so distributed loads are on that centroid problem set, right? Okay, so yeah, when I say centroids, I'm talking about like that could be represented as a distributed load or as a funny shaped object in a center of mass problem, okay? Anything that's on that centroid problem set is uh, those topics are fair game for the test. Um, so on the free body diagram, I'm pretty flexible with, um, with how you treat a distributed load. Like if you have a, say you have a problem like this, okay? And there's your distributed load. Um, you don't have to do the centroid calculations before you do the free body diagram. Okay, so you can show, if you want to do your free body diagram with that still as a distributed load, that's fine with me. Okay, uh, yeah, that's fine, I guess. Maybe I should think about that in the future. It might, you might be better off like representing that as a single force, but I'm not, I'm not going to require that on this test for sure. Um, and then the gravity force, you know it acts somewhere there, you know. You don't have to show that distance or anything. You're just trying to show all the loads. Okay. So yeah, I guess I'm more flexible on how you represent that stuff than than some other so things. Just representing it as one single centroid. Yeah, you could do it like this or you could do it like that. Yeah. Either one of those is fine with me. Any other questions? What? Uh huh. Oh, that was supposed to be a string, yeah. So, oh yeah, right. I guess I I missed that in the free body diagram. So you'd have a force like that from the distributed load, and then a tension force going up. And then you'd have a weight force, and then you'd have that external load. And then you'd have this force vector uh, due to the pin. I think that's a complete free body diagram of what I drew. Except you got to label them. That's not a, you know, that's not a full free body diagram. But shows all the loads. Any other questions? OK. So last time I gave you this problem, and you just were working on it until the end of class. Oops. Yeah, the Fantastic Four monument. So those are all pin joints. This is a fixed joint. We're neglecting the weight of the members. Um, and you have a load coming down of 20,000 newtons. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't change really the difficulty of the problem to include the weights of the individual members. It, it does change the number of loads you have in your equations. You know, that's all. Uh, did anyone finish this? Hmm. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> you finished it if finishing it is like, do, do, do. there's a happy little sun. Huh. Well, that's, that'll do you. Okay, well, let's go through it. And after that, I'm going to do two example problems with kind of interesting, uh, interesting little twists on this idea. So let's do this one. Um, I think we went through and did all the free body diagrams already, right? Okay, so uh, 
the first thing we're going to do is isolate the whole structure. Well, I, the first thing we're going to do, I did this last time too. The first thing is we're going to label the members. Did I, this one was probably one, two, three, okay. Okay, so free body diagram of the whole structure. The fixed joint has a force vector. What did I call that force? Do you have that in your notes? In the in the free body diagram, what did we call that? One uh, G. Okay. Okay, and then M one G. And then the only other external load is the twenty thousand newton force. Anybody want a clarification on why those are the only loads? I think thinking of it as like whatever body you're isolating. You're shrink wrapping, and then you're just looking what's touching the outside of the shrink wrap. That's sort of a useful way to think about it. Um, OK, so Newton's second law says, oh, let's, uh, sorry, before I write that, let's do that table. Pancake artists, row for marzipan. That's the best mnemonic ever. Um, and the coordinate system, let's put it here. Okay, so these loads at the fixed joint are at zero, zero. We'll make that the about point. So rho is zero, zero. The force is F1GX, F1GY. And so there's no moment. And then we have that couple that's also acting at 0, 0. So none of these are relevant for a couple. And so the moment is M1G. Uh, then we have this force. It's acting at 0.5, 0.5. The about point is still 0, 0. So rho is 0 0.5, 0 0.5. The force vector is 0, negative 20,000. And so you get a moment of negative 10,000. So Newton's second law says F1GX, F1GY plus the only other force is the zero negative 20,000 is equal to zero, zero. And the rotational Newton's second law says M one G minus ten thousand is equal to zero. Okay, so we could use these as our first three equations and and then start listing the variables with these three. That's what I've been doing up to this point. That's I think that's the simplest way to think of it. But in practice you can cut down the number of variables by sort of solving things as you go. These are three equations and three variables, so we can solve for what we have. Okay? And then and then these will all just be numbers when we go on to the other bodies. So let's just solve these. Um, so this force F1G, you can see, is equal to 0, 20,000. 
and the couple M1G is equal to 10,000. Okay, so that means that now going on to isolating the individual members, we don't have any variables and we don't have any equations. Okay, these are now just values that we're going to use. Any questions about that distinction? It's the same idea. It's like we're just, we've already started our big system of equations. We've already started solving it. We're doing it in pieces. You can't always do that, but often you can. Um, okay, so let's isolate member one. So what loads are acting on one? Yep. And we know what that is, so I'll just write that as 0, 20,000. And we also have that couple of 10,000. What else? Yep. And up here? Right. Okay, so at 0, 0, let's make 0, 0 the about point. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, we have this 20,000 Newton upward force. Rho is 0, 0, 20,000. No moment. And then we also have that couple. That's at 0, 0. These aren't relevant. And the moment is 10,000. Then at 0, positive 0.5, we have F13. So the row vector is 0, 0.5. Uh, F13x, F13y, and so we have um, negative 0 0.5 F13x. And then finally, at the point zero one, we have f one two x, f one two y. So negative f one two x. Newton's second law says zero twenty thousand plus F13x, F13y, plus F12x, F12y is equal to 0. And the moment equation says 10,000 minus 0 0.5 F13x minus F12x is equal to 0. OK, so our first three equations are F1, I'll put them in an order that I guess uh, makes more sense with how I'm going to have my matrix at the end. So F12x plus 
F13x is equal to 0. F12y, F13y is equal to negative 20,000. And negative F12x minus 0.5 F13x is equal to negative 10,000. And so far we have for variables 12x, 12y, 13x, 13y, and that's it. Okay. Any questions on that, that member? So three equations, uh, four variables. So we can't solve anything yet. So we'll just kick the can down the road. Yes, you could, sure. But, you know, it's, um, it's the same equation, just in disguise. So it doesn't change anything. Yeah. OK, so now let's isolate. Uh, let's see. Let's do, let's do member three, because I think this is the last one we have to do. And then, uh, I don't know. It sound, maybe they'd all, they'd all be pretty easy, I think. Member two only has two forces. So maybe let's do that one. Okay, so we have this diagonal body, um, and what loads are acting on this? Yep, right here we have F23, and up here? Um, F23 acts at uh, negative 0.5, positive 0.5. How about the about point? We don't have to keep using the same about point. Each member is its own calculation. Um, so let's choose one of these two points so we get rid of one of those forces in the moment equation. I guess let's might as well choose this one. So that makes rho for this force 0. F23x, F23y, and so the moment's 0. And this is at the point 0, 1. We have to use the same about point. So 0 minus 0.5 is 0.5. 1 minus 0.5 is 0.5. The force vector is F21x, F21y. So the moment is 0.5 F21y minus 0.5 F21x. Okay, so Newton's second law says F23x, F23y plus F21x, F21y is equal to 0, 0. And the moment equation says negative 0.5 f 21x plus 0.5 f21y is equal to 0.
Okay, so now before we number these equations, we want to reduce the number of variables. Um, so now we're going to look through these equations and see do we have, do we already have an F3, 2? Do we already have an F1, 2? Okay, X and Y both. Um, so here's our list. We already have F1, 2. We don't have 3, 2. So we can replace the, the two 1 variables with one that we already have. So equation 4 says F2, 3, X minus F1, 2, X is equal to 0. Equation 5, F2, 3, Y minus F1, 2, Y after you make that replacement equals 0. And then last, negative, uh, so we're going to replace these. So we have positive 0.5 F12 X minus 0.5 F12 Y is equal to 0. And now our final list of variables is everything we had before 1 2 X 1 2 Y one three x one three y and then two three x two three y so now we have six equations six variables and we can solve that So I don't have this solved. Can I'll do it. Someone else do it too, okay, and help me verify this. So um, let's go, let's put the matrix in this order. 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3. One, two, three, four, five, six, and the B. So this column is the F12 X, F12 Y, F13 X, F13 Y, F23 X, F23 Y. And this is equation one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have 1, 2, x, 1, 3, x is equal to 0. Then we have 1, 2, y, 1, 3, y is equal to negative 20,000. Then we have negative 1, 2, x, negative, all right, negative one of those. Uh, negative 0.5, 1, 3 x's, and that's equal to negative 10,000. Then equation 4, we have 2, 3 x minus 1, 2 x. Equals 0. 2, 3y minus 1, 2y equals 0. And then you have 0.512x minus 0.512y. So 1, well, those are 0.5s. You could replace them with 1s. Okay.
the sad thing about these big systems of equations is you make one mistake and it changes every value, you know? I guess you're probably used to that from circuits, right? Like you get these big systems of equations. Okay, so I get F12 is 20,000, 20,000. F13 is negative 20,000, negative 40,000. And... F23 is 0, 20,000. Okay, so does that make sense? What do we know? We have that one two force body, and that's an easy way to verify this answer, uh, at least make sense out of it. Um, you know that. Uh, these two vectors, 2, 1, and 2, 3, need to be acting equal and opposite along that member. Um, so 2, 1 is acting in the right direction. This one is not. What does it mean when you get the E1 in there in your answer? Does that... Oh, okay. Well, it's like this funky E. No, it's, uh, yeah, it looks lowercase, sort of scripty. I don't know. Okay, so it's just 10? Okay. Okay. Well, Okay. Well, then that makes sense with what we expect in that two-force body. Um, so remember, remember that trick is sort of a, a way to eyeball your answer and do a little sanity check. Anytime you have a body where only two forces are acting, no couples, no third force, they have to act along the line between the two forces, equal and opposite, okay, for that body to be in equilibrium. Any questions on that problem? Okay. Um, so then, in order to make sense out of these answers, uh, we have to think about the loads acting on the individual bodies. So um, on member two, um, we have two one acting up at the top. So that's the opposite of one two. So this force is negative 20,000, negative 20,000. Then we have 2, 3, that's positive 20,000, 20,000, okay? So this two-force body does exactly what it needs to do to be in equilibrium, so that's a good sign. Uh, then here we have uh, member 3, 2. That's the opposite of this one. Three one is the opposite of this one. And 
then we have this force of 20,000 down. And then member one, we have the couple of 10,000 that we solved for before, the force of 0, 20,000, F13, negative 20,000, negative 40,000. And then uh, that is F12, 20,000, 20,000. Okay? Any questions about this whole process? Um, that's kind of along the lines of the, the type of problem that you'll have to do on the exam. Well, when, not on this exam, but on exams in the future. Um, the next stuff I'm going to do is a couple, just sort of throwing a couple little, uh, little curveballs into it. So the first one. is an example where uh, we're going to have a variable that's not a load variable. Okay, So we're always going to have to solve for loads. Um, but this time, you're going to have to solve for something else, too. And this problem is motivated by a biomechanics problem. Let's see. So say somebody's standing up on their toes. In order to do that, um, you know just from uh, all your standing on your toes experience that uh, you need to support your foot. In order to do that, you're firing your calf muscles, right? Like that's what's, that's what's doing the work to hold you up there. Um, so I want to calculate two things. Um, I want to calculate the tension in I'll say I'll say all the calf muscles are one of the two calf muscle groups the gastric nemius and then I also want to calculate What's the force at the ankle joint? So to go from like the real body to um, something that we can do physics calculations on takes knowing where to simplify and where not to simplify. You know, that's always sort of the trick of mathematical modeling. But I think the, the simplest model of this that makes sense is to consider the foot to be connected to the floor by a pin joint at the ankle joint. The foot's connected to the leg, which in turn connects to, 
Now I could make it look like a more accurate model by drawing the body more accurately, but that would just be really sort of sugar <laughs> sugarcoating what we're doing, you know. I mean, all we have is we have a joint between the foot and the rest of the body. And in order to hold the body in place, we have a cable going from the back of the heel to a connection on the back of the leg. And that's why that guy looks the way he does in Monsters, Inc. So they, now doesn't that look like that? You guys don't know, you don't have kids. Never mind. You know. Okay. Um, okay, so let's label these points and I'm gonna give you some approximate locations of uh, where these things happen. So we'll call this the point A, the point B, C, and the center of mass is D. And um, we'll. S oh, and that's it's all based on the origin at the ankle joint. And we'll say that the mass of the body is 80 kilograms. And it would be, it doesn't make the problem any harder to choose a center of mass of the foot and give the foot a mass. But as you can imagine, the mass of the foot isn't a very significant contributor to these values, right? It's compared to 80 kilograms, what's the mass of your foot? Like a quarter of a kilogram or something? So I'm gonna just leave that out and we're gonna treat the foot as massless. Whoa. And now I'll give you these values. So based on this coordinate system, the point A is negative 0.15. This is all in meters. Negative 0.10. B is 0 0.06. Negative 0.01. C is 0.02. 0 0.30 and D is unknown, the the X position. But say we know the we know the Y position. The reason I'm specifying a Y position actually is because it doesn't even matter. Okay. Um, but let's say 1.2. That's probably a pretty reasonable, you know, like your center of mass if you're just standing like this is somewhere in your torso, so 1.2 meters. Um, okay, so now that we have chosen our idealization, we can see that this is a just a structures problem. And also, you can see that we're gonna have this variable we have to solve for that isn't a load, okay? That's something different. Um, but don't let that, you know, don't let that throw you. Um, Variable, you know, these equations have variables in them. You solve for those variables, no matter what they are, okay? And so you're gonna do the same thing here, and we'll see that this is actually a pretty simple problem to solve. That P will come out in your system of equations the same way forces and couples do. Um, so why don't you work together, look at each other's answers, and first we'll just come up with those three relevant free body diagrams, okay? And then we'll come back, compare those, make sure we're, we're on the same page. So um, there's a free body diagram of the body, the foot, and the whole thing, okay? And then we'll come back up here and solve the problem.